Um, all right, guys, um, let's start the lecture. Um, I think we have uh, plenty of people. We've got 31. Um, and in total, I guess you've got um, 33 people here. Um, so instead of wasting time, let's um, simply start. Um, so I hope everyone is fine um, at their homes. Um, there is um, no one who actually got sick or have symptoms, and everyone in your family is fine also. Um, and this is a very good um, step that we actually get to stay at home and at the same time we could study also so that we don't lose any time for um, our preparation for the mids and that's the most important thing um, so recap um, what we already studied um, so so far what we have done is that uh, we have studied the basic function of subject psychology uh, we studied about how our visual perceptions are not real, how things that we deem to be truths are ultimately not the truths. Um, everything is very relative, things cannot be categorized into black or white. Word is a lot more nuanced and colorful um, than we actually think. Um, we also studied about um, the schools of psychology, how people actually believed about what psychology is in medieval times and in other places and that actually um, helped us um, a lot in understanding how people perceive the definition of reality um, in their own specific times. Um, we studied about William Fund um, and his uh, structuralism school of thought. Um, we also studied about um, functionalism um, we studied about how to fix the problems with these um, theories in terms of um, radical behavioralism. Um, you remember that we studied about the classical and operant conditioning. Uh, we had um, a dog and whenever you feed the dog um, you bring in a bell and at some point dogs actually associate the sound of the ring with the food and as soon as the ring and the bell rang and they start drooling um, or salivating um, whatever you call it and um, this is exact uh, actually the definition of conditioning that you actually condition the response of the dog based on an external stimulus we also studied about the positive and negative reinforcement um, how you can actually reward um, or punish behaviors uh, for example when children go to school we reward them for doing their jobs nicely, making nice drawings, uh, coloring within the circle, and then we give them sweets and candies, uh, and we can also give them stars on the cheeks, depending on which school you go to. Uh, just a minute, let me see if someone cannot hear. It. Can everyone hear, or is it just like Shazaman and Jose who cannot hear? Do you still not hear me, Ursulan and Essen? Okay, I guess some people can hear me, some people don't. I thought you can actually write in the chat um, and um, I'm also going to open up the mic at the end of the lecture so you can ask any question if you want. Hussam, can you check your um, settings on your phone or computer or whatever you're using if the volume is fine or um, if you need headsets or something? Because apparently everyone else can hear. All right, seems like everyone can get here, so we can continue back to where we were. Um, so we were at the uh, classical and operant conditioning. So why do we actually reward little children for going to school, not weeping, um, 
um, not playing in the mud, um, drawing within the circle and give them stars on the cheeks and candies and toffees and pat them. Um, it's basically the same principle that we reward people for doing nice things that they do and we punish them for the things that uh, we do not want them to do. Um, it's the same principle that we use in classrooms. So if you study well, um, if you've been working hard, um, you've understood all the theories and everything else, um, then um, at some point you're going to get graded for that. And if you get good grades, that would be positive reinforcement. And despite um, all instructions, if you do not show up in class, um, if you do not study hard, if you do not attempt your paper well, um, then you won't be getting good grades. And that is something um, which is categorized under um, punishment. Uh, and then we also studied about um, behavioralism, cognitive behavioralism, which has the component of um, how human beings uh, make meanings of things around them, how do we perceive um, reality, and then how do we actually use uh, principles of behavioralism um, to uh, fix those cognitive distortions. For example, we tend to see things in black and white, um, and we think that there is no nothing in between, uh, there is no gray matter. So if you like someone, you like them so much that, you know, you think of them as gods and idols um, and if you do not like them then you almost hate them and they're evil and they're incarnate villains and things like that um, and that becomes um, a little bit problematic um, in terms of your expression and your behaviors and your adjustment in society so these were the things that we studied we also studied about research methods how to differentiate um, um, valid re scientific research from uh, pseudoscientific beliefs. Uh, so, uh, for example, if you go to an um, astronomist and uh, he tells you about your future, how many kids you're going to have, um, what kind of car you're going to buy, uh, what are you going to choose for a career and things like that, then um, you might want to ask them that if they have any scientific uh, reason for giving you that prognosis, because that certainly is not a very scientific method to tell people what they're going to be doing, uh, regardless of any information um, that corroborates or negates um, those prognoses. So these are the things that we studied before. So today, uh, we're going to be studying the next topic, which is a very interesting one. Um, and that would be the relation with biology and um, psychology. So how does that um, relate that our body actually responds to what we think and our thinking is actually influenced by um, how we feel like sensations um, so interestingly I'm going to show you a video that is going to um, demonstrate the point um, um, that we have a very strong um, you know, we have our bodies and our uh, minds have very strong correlations and that cannot be negated. Um, so let me go and show you the video. Uh, okay, let me see if I can share the voice of the video also, um, as well as the subtitle so you can actually study. And who's the one drawing? on the screen did I give you the share actually all right guys um, I hope you really find this video informative um, now to tackle your questions um, I mean, some of you um, who have not completed watching it on your computers, I'll give you some time so you can go and watch it. Um, and as soon as you're done, let me know and um, I'll explain um, the purpose of this whole video as well as showing you some other uh, pictures that explain the video a little bit better. All right, welcome back, um, everyone. I hope you've seen the video. Uh, the basic purpose of the video was to let you know that there are um, neurochemicals in our body that actually affects um, how we react, how we think, um, how we uh, perceive things. Um, many people think that they come from 
um, your genetics. There are a large portion of your personality is actually made up um, by genetic factors. Um, and uh, these genetic factors actually make up um, your behavior. Now, um, let me give you an example. So imagine if you're going into a park, the weather is really nice, you know, there's um, wind blowing and um, it's cloudy and it's not too warm. Um, and then you're with your friend or you're listening to music in your iPods. Um, and suddenly you uh, feel that there's someone behind you um, or you think or you hear something that um, someone's knocking, even with the sound of the music that you're listening. And when you turn back, you see a very big, black, scary dog coming towards you. So there are two responses that you can actually have to, against these things. One is um, that either you could stand there or fight with the dog, um, or if the dog is too big and it's too scary, you're probably going to really, really run fast and try to make sure that you're safe. Now, that is the situation, but how do you actually feel when this thing happens? I mean, five minutes ago when you were walking, the weather was really nice and you were thinking about nice thoughts um, and you're feeling super uh, cool and comfortable around you. And then all of a sudden, when you see the dog coming towards you, now think about the physical changes in your body. You probably start sweating. Uh, your fear uh, level actually went to the whole new level. And um, your face probably flushed with all the red um, in your face. And then you thought about different places where you could hide um, and run. And um, all these changed only in five minutes. Um, so sorry about my cat. Um, and that's exactly one more thing about um, human behaviors also, you know, um, you cannot control cats and you cannot control yourself depending on um, in which situation you are. Now, that was the apparent effect of um, the big dog. But what were the biological um, changes that happened during your um, running away from the dog? Now, I'll share um, a picture in which I'll tell you about some of the neurotransmitters that are affected um, when you actually see the dog. So here you see, there you go. Um, so there are a lot of neurotransmitters, but um, some of the most important are adrenaline, um, that is fight or flight. And what it does is that um, adrenaline is produced in stressful situations that increases your heart rate and your blood flow, leading to physical boost and heightened awareness. Now in that situation, what happens is that um, instead of thinking about um, nice weather and music um, and what you're going to eat in the afternoon or how you're going to dress for the evening uh, or what things that you have to do at school, everything goes out of your mind and the immediate importance comes becomes, uh, you know, your safety becomes the foremost priority of yours. And that's uh, what happens biologically is that your brain actually uh, uh, anticipates the fear that if the dog comes and it's going to bite you, that's going to be painful and you have to go to the hospital and you're probably going to get the disease and things like that. Um, then um, it tells your body to actually um, choose between two options. Either you can fight um, or you can flight. So that means you either have to stay there or you have to run. Now, the dog is too big and you think that, you know, fighting uh, is probably not a good choice and you're probably going to get bitten by a dog. Um, your more likely choice is going to be uh, running away. But if you think the dog is small and you can handle the dog, you're probably going to stay there and fight with the dog. And that's only one uh, split second in which your brain actually uh, does all these chemical processes um, and decides that if you have to fight or if you have to flight. Now, one of the uh, other important thing is uh, dopamine. Dopamine is actually your pleasure hormone um, that helps with um, the addiction, movement, and motivation. Um, when the dopamine is released in your body, um, your behaviors are um, more 
likely to repeat for example if you get good grades next time you're going to study more because uh, you like the feeling of dopamine being released in your body um, it's the same with serotonin um, that contributes to your mood and your well-being your happiness you sleep very well um, if your serotonin levels are um, high enough and your digestive system is regulated um, that's the exact same thing when you exercise and do light exposures um, and then um, that, that's how actually it affects your body. Now, uh, let me give you a very interesting story, and that's a very interesting psychological case uh, in which um, what happened is that, um, so if everyone could actually open your books, uh, so I can show you the interesting case that we have. I think it's on page. 64. I'll just search it. So look at this picture. Now, um, that's a very classical case um, of a young man um, who was a foreman. Um, he worked on a work um, crew. Um, his name was Phineas Gage. And what happened is that um, in old times, now we have bombs, so we actually blow up the whole mountains and we take the minerals and diamonds and gold um, out of that um, but in medieval times people did not have sophisticated equipment uh, so what they did is that um, they actually um, drill a hole in stone and um, they had this rod a steel rod and then they would put dynamite in that and then they would blow up the whole mountain and once the mountain is uh, blown up you can take take all the minerals and um, you know, expensive um, materials out of that, like gold or diamonds or whatever. So what happened is that uh, the one of these workers, his name was Phineas Gage, um, when he uh, was putting the dynamite in, and it exploded all of a sudden, and the rod actually went through his eye and came out of his head. Uh, so what happened is that um, right after the accident, um, he passed away. Well, he survived the accident. But within the two months, Gage could walk, talk, and move normally. Um, but the injury forever changed his personality. So what happened is that, you know, when he went home, uh, so they put the bandage on his eye and he wrapped it around that. Uh, but what happened with his personality is that um, he used to be a very honest and dependable worker before that. Um, so, you know, um, he took care of his family. He did not lie. Um, he did his uh, work in a very um, happy manner but what happened is that uh, so what happened is that um, within two months the gauge personality actually changed he became very foul mouthed he started lying um, so what happened is that his personality actually changed after the accident now one question is why did um, the personality change by a physical accident um, so when the rod goes through your eye and comes out of your brain uh, there is something that's damaged and if that's damaged, why should it actually change your personality? Well, it seems like there is a very good reason for that. And what happened is that um, that uh, we have different brain parts which are connected to different um, functions of our brain. Um, so if I could show you the picture uh, of how our brain is divided. So look at this. Can everyone see the new picture? So um, what you see is that our brain is divided into different parts. Um, there are four basic uh, parts and one um, uh, cerebellum, that's the lower part of the brain. So the frontal part is the part where you actually plan for things. Um, you do the reasoning, uh, you make logics and things. Um, you also do the problem solving. Um, and your morality, personality, social skills, recognizing, and things like that. 
um, these are actually uh, things that um, for example these things um, these are the things that actually um, help you um, decide um, and you know that that part of the brain is actually connected with uh, your frontal uh, lobe so uh, any of these tasks planning um, reasoning uh, problem solving morality um, that is connected with your uh, frontal uh, lobe now behind that um, there's something called parietal lobe um, maybe you should change the color for that and that is your parietal lobe uh, and that uh, part of your brain actually helps in recognizing sensation and body position and objects. For example, if I send you, um, I throw a ball towards you. So the part of the brain that actually um, anticipates the speed um, the size um, and the color of the ball um, and the hand-eye coordination is your parietal lobe. Um, so it recognizes sensation. For example, if you're, there's an ant or there's um, an insect on your body and the part where um, the brain brain part where uh, that actually identifies that threat is parietal lobe. Um, also the sense of time and space, reading of comprehension, um, association between functions of other lobes, that's what a parietal lobe does. Now how do you see and uh, integrate visual information? Now that goes to another part of the brain that's called occipital lobe here. Um, what happens is that um, when you actually look at things, you're basically only looking at their shape, um, size, color, but you do not make actually um, you do not actually make a decision about um, the uh, reality of that thing or what it's actually called. That's the job of parietal lobe to recognizing things um, and um, you know, coordinating all the visual information that you get. Um, but the image itself it goes to the occipital lobe which does the vision and integrating of visual information that includes the distance and shape and color and things like that. Now, um, for example, why is that when small children um, walk and they keep stumbling down and they cannot walk properly without any help? Now, that part of the brain uh, is not developed in uh, little children and that is called cerebellum. That actually helps you in maintaining your balance and muscular coordination. Um, and uh, what about the language? How do you hear uh, and speak and learn um, and you do the sensory speech? Now that's another part of your brain that does that. You see how complicated the brain is? And that's called the temporal, temporal, uh, temporal lobe. And now all of these parts actually have two parts. Uh, one is on the left and one is on the right. Um, the temporal lobe, what it does is that it um, does the understanding of a speech and the language and what you hear and how you speak um, and the memory um, and how to process that and how do you learn things. These all things are done by temporal lobe. Now the um, interesting fact is that that all of these uh, parts they actually have uh, two sides. One is the left and one is the right. Now I'll give you a very um, short quiz, a very interesting one. Uh, and if you answer that right, you know, I might show you my cat also. So I'll show you another picture. Now that are that is the uh, view of your brain from the top. Now how many people can uh, tell me where is the occipital lobe? I mean that's kind of unfair because that's already written on that. Any guesses where is the occipital lobe? You just saw the other picture. Okay, we have got Sania with front, Aisha and Saad with backside. And then we have got left, lower, all parts. And how hard is that? It's actually written there. You look at that occipital pole. All right, uh, I'll give you a different one actually. Uh, that's actually not written. Um, by the way, guys, that's on the lower side, on the back of your brain. So that's the front and that's the back. So your occipital lobe is at the back. I'll show you the picture afterwards. Now, where is the temporal lobe? Uh, the one that helps you hear and speak and understand and do the learning and memory. Where Fessel is the best answer actually. It's on the both sides. Um, on this side here and on this side here. Um, so both your ears. Now you can think of uh, this also. Um, what are the organs that actually help you um, do that specific function? For example, your eyes. 
um, that are related to occipital lobe and that's on your back so your eyes um, take um, light and exposure from the objects in front of you and that goes straight on the back so that must be occipital lobe and what are the organs that help you listen that's definitely your ears and your ears must be on your side of your head I mean that's mostly how they are unless you have a different one so they must be on the um, left and right side uh, I also told you that um, all these lobes have both sides uh, left and right so we also have a distinction between left brain and right brain and we will be studying about their functions uh, at some other time also um, so that answer is right um, very good that we have a um, right temporal lobe and then you have a left temporal lobe. Now, who's going to tell me about the parietal lobe? Where is that? Uh, I think Aisha got it right. It's almost in the mid. Look at that. That's a parietal lobe. And what does parietal lobe do? I just showed you the other picture. Does anyone remember what does parietal lobe uh, help you do? No idea? Mm, sensation. Okay recognition reading um, I mean you read a book or something else with your eyes so it's not exactly that but you're right I mean you can recognize the written material from that um, well the um, language is uh, more of the function of your temporal lobe but anyways, Aisha was right. Um, so you could do the uh, recognition and you could also um, feel a sensation. Um, and I'll just give you uh, one more. And then after that, I'll show you the uh, picture back uh, and back to the other picture where you could actually um, see the functions of the brain. Now, so we are done with the occipital lobe, bridal lobe, and the frontal lobe, and the temporal lobe. So we got five ones. So now look at the picture again that I showed you of their different functions. Okay, does everyone see that again? All right, so now you see occipital lobe that was in the back of your head and straight in front of the eyes. So your eyes take information and that goes straight to the occipital lobe and that is vision and integrating visual information with color, shape and distance. And now about temporal lobe. So that's about where your ears are on the both left and right side. So you can use it to understand um, spoken material, like you're listening to me right now. Uh, so basically your temporal lobe is um, taking all the information. Um, and then uh, the language, um, I mean, for other people who do not speak um, English, um, for them it will be just noise. But the part of brain uh, that actually process it for you and make you um, understand what I'm speaking um, is language. And then you could also um, use, uh, use it for hearing and speaking and the memory and learning and things like that. Now, uh, which part was that that I showed you on top in the front? So that's the frontal lobe where you actually use it for planning, reasoning, problem solving, personality, and social skills. Um, now, do you remember the case that I just told you about Phineas Gage? Um, you know, the guy um, who got into an accident and the rod actually went from his eye and came up from the brain. Which part of the brain did he damage? Any other guesses? Everyone is saying occipital just because Hamza first said that. seems like only Aisha is paying attention here it's the frontal lobe look that that's where the rod went from his eye and straight out of the brain here and if that part of your brain is damaged uh, what is the problem that you're going to have exactly the personality so his personality changed he became a liar he became a dishonest person he became um, very bad in his temperament so his personality was actually um, damaged um, and his motor function and emotions were actually really bad. So that is um, what um, connection is um, with your brain um, and your um, body. So you know everything actually changes when it comes to 
um, the connection between um, your body and your soul. Now, there's one more important thing that I briefly wanted to um, tell you about. When people who have been studying um, biology or um, you know, who have actually appeared for the uh, medical school and never passed that exam, uh, they probably have read that. But I can uh, you know, briefly touch upon how a human body actually functions. So for that, I can get you back to the book. All right. Um, so finally, how do we, how all these processes actually work? So we, for uh, up till now, we have studied about um, how neurotransmitters actually travel in our body to um, tell us about the threat, uh, um, to help us decide into fighting or uh, flighting the situation, um, and how that happens in a split second. We also studied about uh, different parts of the brains and um, what are their functions. We also study about the fact that if some of those uh, physiological parts get damaged, then that part of our personality um, that is actually affected by uh, any accident, um, that actually changes the function of that. So we study about Phineas Gage, um, whose brain got damaged and then his personality changed. But how does it all happen? I mean, for that, we have to study a little bit about human anatomy and how does it work. So that is um, actually the skeleton of our bodies. Mm, so that's your brain. I just showed you the picture. Uh, and that's your spinal cord that goes down deep to your back until just above your uh, hip bone. So what happened is that uh, if you look at that, uh, everything that happened in uh, brain and then spinal cord, um, that is called central nervous system. That has two parts. One is the brain, which is only that part. And then this long bone-like structure going straight down, that's our backbone or uh, spinal cord. Now, um, that's the vertical um, information center. There is another part, which is a peripheral nervous system, and that goes away from that spinal cord and your brain. Um, so what you do is that um, your all the sensory information uh, goes to your um, brain through these peripheral, per peripheral nerves to your spinal cord, um, and then it goes up to your central nervous system, and then your brain decides what to do about that. And once it has decided what to do that, for example, in that scenario, uh, think about the dog again. So if uh, you decide to run, um, after looking at the dog. So the information from your body, um, your eyes, your ears, um, your smell, all the senses tell you the dog is coming. It goes directly to the spinal cord and it goes up to the central nervous system. Your central nervous system decides that, okay, now you have to fight. Um, and, the, uh, and there's another system which is called the uh, motor system. And um, that actually is the central nervous system's decision um, that goes back and through spinal cord and it goes to peripheral nerves and tells your body to run because if you stay there then there's a very good chance that you're going to get hurt and body actually helps you um, keep yourself safe and without danger now there are two parts of peripheral nervous system also one is the somatic system and that is the system that actually you can control that means that if you see the dog your body can voluntarily decide to run and then it tells you your legs um, and your thighs and your knees to get into the action and run. But there's another system, which is autonomic system, and that is not under your control. For example, your heart. Uh, as soon as you see the dog, um, it starts beating. So you're, you have no control of your heart. It does it automatically. So there's no way that you can actually voluntarily tell your heart to beat faster or beat slower. Um, for example, if if that were possible, you didn't have to exercise. You would just sit at home and think, okay, heart start beating as fast as, as, as though I am running. Um, and it will start running. And that's not how it works. Now, there are two um, mechanisms of autonomic system also. One is the sympathetic um, system. That means that um, it alerts your body. Uh, in that case, your autonomic system tells your heart to beat faster. Um, and then, you know, it will help you in regulating the um, processes that would actually help you run fast. And that makes sure that your body is safe. Now, there's other system, which is parasympathetic system. So once you're away, once you're at home, uh, once you're at a safe place and you do not think about threat anymore, 
So what your body does is that it tells your brain that everything is fine now. You don't have to run. You know, dogs are not going to bite you. You're safe. You can enjoy the music again. You can you know, enjoy the weather. And that puts your body again to a very um, calm and smooth um, situation where you were, you were exactly before you were running. Now, that's the job of parasympathetic system. Now, imagine if you didn't have that and your body, your, your heart would beat all the time and you would keep um, running all the time. They, that At some point, you would get you know, really tired of that and you know, you'd possibly die of that. And this is why we need both systems, the sympathetic system and parasympathetic system that actually um, tells you to uh, keep your body at a um, normal state. So you do, you do not actually um, are in one perpetual state all the time. So these are um, the things um, that um, make up our uh, biological systems. And uh, these are exactly the same routes that the neurotransmitters that we were talking about earlier uh, went through your spinal cord, into your brain, and then back to your motor systems. And now you understand the biological basis um, of our brains. So um, that was 